I'm very honored that the uh, committee chose me. I'm delighted to receive this. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> Ingrid Dabachis has been a friend and someone whose work I have admired for a long time. But actually, I just say that more than that, I think that what's it's really very impressive that the uh, that the bank chose to uh, to include mathematics uh, among the basic sciences. I feel that uh, <clears throat> math mathematicians don't in general uh, aren't in general very visible to the to the public, uh, and it's marvelous to see mathematicians uh, being honored in this way. Uh, you worked in algebraic geometry, math so-called pure, but then you switched into computer vision research, and why? I've always really enjoyed both pure and applied math. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, I actually spent a summer uh, working on the atomic reactor for the su uh, submarine at Westinghouse, so I was very much involved with applied math. But then I really fell in love with pure math as a result of uh, several f fantastic professors at Harvard. And I really found that the uh, uh, abstraction was, uh, was very enticing and seductive. But then uh, at a certain point in my career when I'd, I'd proved a theorem that I'd really been searching for, uh, for a long time, I thought this might be a, the opportunity, if I ever was going to do it, to go back to some of my applied interests. And one of my long-term interests has always been how, in heaven's name, the brain works. It's, uh, it seemed to me from an early age that this was one of the greatest mysteries that we face in science. <clears throat> Can you explain in very simple words for the general public your main contribution to algebraic geometry? Well, uh, my main focus in algebraic geometry uh, was a construction which goes by the technical name a moduli space. But this is it's not too hard to explain. It's, it's really a map. Uh, what is a map uh, from the most general standpoint? It's simply, uh, it's one object, a piece of paper in the case of a map, whose points uh, and the layout of those points tells you something about something much bigger and much harder to get your hands on. In the case of a map, the real world, and it will show all the countries and, and cities and so on. Uh, but you can have maps of a different kind. So in algebraic geometry, the objects that we're concerned with go by this rather uh, <coughs> uh, unusual name. They're called algebraic varieties. And there are many of these, and we try to get our hands in, on them and understand them better. But uh, one approach is to try to make a map of, of all of the varieties of a certain kind. That map is actually another variety. Just like a piece of paper is something in the world, you're taking a small part of the world and making a map of a big part of the world. In moduli spaces, we're taking one particular variety, and we're trying to make that a map for a whole collection of objects. So I, I think this is, uh, is a general construction that applies to many different areas, and I hope that clarifies it a little bit. Mathematics are said to be the motor of innovation, but people really know about the maths behind their computers, for example. In which way do maths shape society, and do maths receive the credit they deserve? Well, I think there's, uh, there's several answers to that. Really, we, have, we can split math up into pure math and applied math. In applied math, we're really always focusing on particular things that uh, that society needs. Leonard Euler, who was the greatest mathematician of the 18th century, uh, he would help um, <clears throat> Friedrich the Great in designing earthworks, canals, and uh, Archimedes was famous for the armaments that he designed. Uh, so all these people did pure math as well. In the 20th century, I think pure math has, to some extent, split from applied math, uh, and the connections aren't quite as tight as they used to be. But pure math is really uh, engaged in developing the fundamental tools of mathematics and understanding the abstract structures of mathematics more deeply. In applied math, the basic goal is to create models of something going on in the real world to which some kind of 
math, um, which some kind of math is, is useful in clarifying. So, you know, when, you, when Newton came up with the law of gravity, you could then do mathematics on this law, and it then clarified all the, uh, the complicated things that the planets and the moon uh, did in the sky. Uh, so in the same way, we try to build models of things. So in my own work in computer vision, we've tried to make models which describe some aspect of, of the process of seeing and understanding what you're seeing. Mathematics are said to be the motor of innovation, but people rarely know about the maths behind their computers, for example. In which way do maths shape society, and do maths receive the credit they deserve? Uh, absolutely. Mathematics is one of the main engines that's behind uh, all the marvelous inventions and innovations that, that we have. But you have to understand that there is both pure and applied math here. So pure math is the part of math which is really engaged in developing the fundamental tools about mathematical structures. Applied mathematicians uh, are always engaged in uh, working on things of, of relevance to our society. Going back to Archimedes and his invention of instruments to hold off the Romans from Syracuse for several, for a decade or so. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that what pure math uh, is engaged in is, is hard often to explain to the public, so people are, are not aware of that. But when you come down to the applied math, it's not all that hard to explain what some of the mathematical structures are, which, uh, which really are, um, support all the contemporary innovations in technology. Is there a mathematical approach to understanding thought and the brain? Yes, I, I believe so. This is not a universally accepted by scientists who are studying the brain right now. But my belief is that to really understand it, you first have to make a mathematical model of what thought really is. What in, what in some sense is the structure that we're setting up in our heads and, and, uh, and working with in order to understand and what's going on and, and plan our actions. And my belief is that the uh, fundamentals of this kind of thinking are essentially statistical in nature, that we should view uh, what's going on in our, in our heads as uh, statistical inference, uh, that we rely on assembling a huge amount of data about uh, how th things work in the world and what we expect to see in the world and we have to combine that with uh, what's happening to us every day and use that to infer what's really going on beyond the very noisy and incomplete information which we receive about the world around us. Mm. Has your work on computer vision led already to applications in the industry? My work hasn't, uh, but uh, I, I think that some of the things I've been involved with will reach fruition in the next uh, few decades. I mean, uh, my work has really been on the abstract mathematical side, constructing the sort of models I was talking about. Uh, but for instance, I have a, a former student, Song Chen Zhu, uh, who does lots of uh, really concrete things that uh, really <coughs> make it. Um, make it very likely that, let me start over again. I, I see I got, I'm not saying this, this uh, clearly. Uh, okay, uh, my own work has, has not really been directly involved in applications. It's been really, is concentrated on developing the theory behind these, ap the possible applications and the models necessary. But already we begin to see that computer vision has become quite effective in driving cars without human intervention. There's this annual contest in California. And I think within the next 20 years, we're going to see many uh, real, uh, really concrete applications that people can use for computer vision.